On April 20, 2010, the Deepwater Horizon oil rig suffered a catastrophic blowout, catching fire and taking the lives of 11 workers on board. As oil began to flow uncontrollably from the well 5,000 feet below the water's surface, British Petroleum scrambled to find a solution. Many of the people in the coastal areas are engaged in, in, in commercial activities that re rely on marine resources, whether it be mussels, whether it be shrimp. I was one of the first to be a part of a group that were commercial spear fishermen. We moved to Destin in the early 70s. So my sister and I are actually business partners and our brother manages our fleet of boats. We have five boats. So it is kind of a family operation. Uh, we were the first ones ever of our kind and that's how I made my living. I live out there, I work out there, I go to church out there. You know, it's, it's the source of my living, really. That's how, basically, I bought my first home in um, Gretna, Louisiana, from spearfishing. Well, it was right out of high school. My brother had just gotten certified, and he asked me if I wanted to try a breath of underwater. So I did, and I was hooked. And I thought just for a season, but it turned into a 26-year career for me. My dad came here from Wisconsin by boat. He came down the Mississippi River, went to Chicago, the Illinois River, Mississippi River, hit the Gulf of Mexico and hung a left. This is a catastrophe of biblical proportions. The oil company, they're very powerful. Uh, and so they basically say to the regulators, again, it used to be Minerals Management Service, but not just them, EPA's involved, all the key regulators. So we, uh, we're on top of it. We're the expert. Eleven days into the spill, BP and the U.S. Coast Guard began the use of the chemical dispersants Core Exit 9500A and 9527A. Right away, they were given the green light. We heard this right after the spill, and they basically denied the federal government access to a crime scene. It's almost like the American people have amnesia when you know you have a, such a fight over climate change legislation and alternative energy legislation. We learned later that the Environmental Protection Agency didn't approve of it and BP was allowing to continue to use this person through daily exceptions to the law. They say it's the best we have and it's not generally as toxic as the, as the oil, so let us use it. Again, the regulators just put their rubber stamp on it. The decision to use so much dispersant and to deploy it at 5,000 feet below the sea level right at the wellhead um, was a cost-benefit analysis. The golden rule is you have all the gold, you make the rules. The cost of cleaning up oil as it arrived on beaches were higher than it was to use the chemical dispersant. As a result, we had international fleets bringing their boats in to skim the oil we had thousands of shrimpers out there retrofitting their boats to skim the oil, and yet we're applying this chemical at 5,000 feet, creating this mix of dispersant and oil that is changing the properties of the oil, so skimming is no longer effective. Once it sinks, then they have no means or method of dealing with it at all. So there really wasn't anything to pick up or clean up. We were just supposed to report it anyhow if we found it. When people decided to use dispersant, what they're doing is saying, we don't want to see this material on the beaches. We want to keep it away from the beach, which is where the people are. So we're taking it out of places where it's more visible, but unfortunately it's going into places where there's more life, and it has a bigger impact on the life in the Gulf. Persons basically take the oil, break it into smaller particles, and make it more water soluble. And when it's more water soluble, it's more easily ingested um, through an organism, say a fish or a dolphin. Once inside it, 
the oil properties are such that it can cross cell membranes easier. And there's your exposure. After spending several months sampling in the Gulf, Marco Kaltofen conducted an experiment to examine the effects of dispersant on crude oil in a lab. We are in the Water Quality Laboratory at the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at Worcester Polytechnic Institute. Right now on the magnetic stirrer, I've got a bottle of clean seawater collected from the Florida Keys just a couple of weeks ago. And what we're going to do is we're going to add about one milliliter, about one third of one percent of one of BP's crude oils from its spill off of Louisiana in the Gulf of Mexico. So once we add that, we'll start the clock. So I think my concern is we used more than we've ever used before. We've used compounds that are not allowed to be used in many places for this kind of work and we use them a lot closer to a large number of people. So when we went to places like uh, Mississippi or southern Louisiana, places where we actually found dispersant in the water column and in the air, uh, that's where we started to show a lot more concern. We'd expected that, okay, dispersant was used at the wellhead and dispersant was used to break up slicks in the deep water. Why are we seeing it in inshore waters? Why are we seeing as late as August 30th, 2010. Okay, that's 60 seconds. We'll stop the stirrer bar. And very slowly, the oil droplets that are mixed in with the seawater, they make their way to the surface, just like they would from, say, a leaking underwater oil well in the Gulf of Mexico. That's 20 seconds. Most of the droplets, even though they're small, start to reach the surface. And you can see a small slick of oil appearing, half a minute. Already when you're looking, you can see that the water is fairly clear. So now what we're gonna do is add a little bit of dispersant. This is made by Nalco. This is Core Exit 9500A. We're gonna add it about one part in 25 compared to the oil. That's 40 microliters if you're keeping track. And what this lets us do is see what happens to the oil and how it behaves differently once we add some dispersant. The first thing that happens, you can see that the oil instantly races to the sides of the glass. And now it's starting to adhere to the glass. Let's turn the stirrer back on. And we'll let that mix for a minute, just like we did before see if there are any differences. Nalco, the maker of Core Exit, protected information about its main ingredients by claiming it as a trade secret under the Toxic Substances Control Act. It was not until June that they handed over this information to the EPA. What NALCO does openly state is that no long-term studies have been done regarding the toxicity or ecological effects of Corexit 9500A. I think a lot of our stress, and I speak for all the citizens in the whole Gulf Coast, I think our, our stress is the unknown factors. None of us have ever dealt with anything like this before. So the only thing we can go by is what we hear on the TV and the radio. And so much of that so far has proven to be inaccurate or untruthful, so now we don't know what to believe. This is my home, this is where my roots are, my family's here, all my family's here. Um, I don't think I could leave it, but I sure wouldn't be happy doing something else for a living either. Sometimes you just want to go home and cry, but then in front of everybody else you want to keep a positive face on the whole situation. And if I lose all that, what's that worth in money? I mean, is a, is a, is a legal settlement going to really take care of that? Not really. Now this time when we stop the stirrer, when we have a mixture of dispersant and crude oil, instead of the crude oil going right back to the surface, much of it stays in the water itself. 
the water stays discolored. Many of the toxic compounds that are in the oil remain in the water instead of moving back to the surface where they could be skimmed. What's happening now is because we're getting about 35 times more of the most toxic hydrocarbons in the crude oil staying in the water column, we're finding that the toxicity of the water is actually increased by adding dispersant to the crude oil. If the crude oil hadn't had dispersant in it at all, we would have far fewer of these most toxic compounds. When we look at the total amount of oil that stays in the water, compared to just using crude, once we've used the dispersant, that's over a hundred times increase in the amount of petroleum that we find staying in the water. Essentially, we mix it into the water column, where as fish pass through or plankton pass through, their fatty tissues picked up those compounds. Unfortunately, those, those heavy compounds, the ones that the dispersant put in the water column, are also the most toxic. We looked at oysters, mussels, birds, we looked at fin fish, we looked at lobsters. What happened was, when we looked at creatures where dispersant had been applied, they tended to have higher levels of the more toxic oil compounds than where it wasn't applied. I mean, it's not like this was a big shock. That's what dispersants do. It turns a two-dimensional problem into more of a three-dimensional problem, um, allowing the oil to disperse into the water column, become more water-soluble, mix with the environment, um, and then basically disappear from sight. The bioavailable fraction of oil in an ocean ecosystem is greatly increased, uh, 10 to 50 times when you add chemical dispersants. So it's not gone, it's just below the surface. In a lot of cases we're learning, um, submerged in pockets and on the, the bottom of the ocean. So there was substantial, was and is substantial concern about did we take out a whole year class of the larvae of certain organisms? Among the concerns is bluefin tuna. That's a spawning area for one of the most magnificent fish in the ocean. Getting the oil past you know, the outer layer of the organism and inside is usually a barrier that isn't so easy to cross. If dispersants have an effect on the food chain, it's going to be much more damaging, much more uh, uh, a long-term recovery period. They're not sure what the ultimate damage to the fishing grounds will be. To this day, we don't know the full extent of damage. Uh, it's something that's in controversy, and it shouldn't be the case. There should be equity in, in, in the permitting process, uh, in the enforcement of environmental laws, in the prosecution of polluters, all those kind of things. So it's a policy approach. You know, it's an issue of ethics and principles, but also the accountability on the part of our government that was lacking, and it still remains lacking. The fear of the unknown is, is hard to experience. The fear is of the unknown, because nobody knows what the oil spill is going to cause in the short term or the long term, and the long term is scarier than the short term. We're getting no answers. Fishermen, we don't hear anything about our uh, future. I think I'm an optimist, and I like to try to, to be positive. And my first meeting with BP, uh, they were very kind. Um, my other six meetings with them have not been that way. I've been running my own boat for 26 and fishing here for 35 years, and I'm not ready to stop that for a living yet. I try to approach it like I approach everything else. Prepare for the worst, and hope for the best, and trust God to take care of the rest. Almost two years have gone by, and we're still collecting samples out in the Gulf of Mexico. We're still finding that we're getting fresh oil in places. We have recent oil samples that come to us from Mississippi and Florida that still show BP's MC252 oil washing up on the shore.
What would the spill have looked like if dispersants hadn't been applied? We would have likely seen even more slicks on the surface and beaches of the Gulf, but much less would have loomed under the surface. Many scientists and researchers now fear that the long-term impacts have yet to fully unfold. My biggest fear is that we learn lessons and all too soon we forget them. We don't know what the effect of the dispersants will be. We just don't know and that's the problem they're facing right now. They don't know how to go about planning. There are, are people in Baton Rouge and New Orleans and communities across the country who are engaged in trying to seek redress for what they see as moral transgressions uh, that left them more vulnerable, more exposed. You know, people are suffering financially, people are, are getting sick, and it's gonna get worse. These people are strong. If you give them a solvable problem and a time frame in which to do it, a window of opportunity, they will do it. But if you give them unknowns that extend out over time, no one knows how to solve those problems. It has to be made clear that any lingering effects are dealt with how to deal with those is beyond me. I don't know how one gets rid of dispersants. I don't know how one gets rid of oil that keeps coming ashore. Nobody can give you an answer on that because we haven't been in this position before. We've never had an oil spill this magnitude. So no one really knows how to go about offsetting it. It was an experiment. It was a, a giant global experiment that we did in the Gulf of Mexico. It really shows that, that once the oil gets in the water, there's not a whole lot you can do about it. They are still running their PR train, you know, that they're a great oil company. 